Hi, everyone. I'm Kevin Strike, and I'm here with Alex Beddows. Hey, everyone. Hey, so Alex, um, before we uh, talk about the, this episode, I want to get your thoughts on channels. As most people know, we released channels on ArtStation Worldwide um, not too long ago. And um, yeah, I want to get your thoughts as an artist on, uh, on channels and what you think. Well, I mean, I've got to be honest. When I first saw it and I first saw it coming out, I wasn't sure it was for me. I was a bit skeptical. I mean, my, my usual browsing before channels was always the trending tab and communities and just browsing people's work who shared it online. Um, and channels came out and I was a bit skeptical. I was kind of like, ah, oh, it's probably not going to affect the way I browse. And actually it's changed a lot. It's been very nice being able to organize the top, the top row into like the categories I usually like to look at. And when I finished my usual browsing, I can just dive into the categories and look a little bit more in depth at them. So it's actually changed the way I use our session quite a bit, surprisingly. You know, I didn't, ex- I, didn't I kind of went in in the mindset of I'm probably not going to use it. So mm-hmm. it's been a very pleasant surprise to see, you know, actually it's been very helpful for me in the way I browse our station. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good feedback. Um, I think like, you were somebody that was using ArtStation and before, and then now you're using it in a slightly different way. The reason that we were, one of the main reasons that we were uh, wanted to release channels was to cater to a broader audience on ArtStation as well. And like, if you're a comic book artist, for example, you, which there are, there were, there always have been a lot of uh, comic book artists on ArtStation, but they don't tend to get uh, visibility on the trending wall or on, on the on the front on the homepage. So having a place for them where you can have a channel of comic book art and, uh, you know, those great comic book artists of the world will, uh, will be able to get visibility and be able to interact with one another and uh, build each other up is something that was uh, important for us and why we want to do it. So yeah, it's, it's interesting seeing it uh, roll out. And if you have any feedback, please send it to us. Um, yeah, write to us, uh, leave a comment or, um, yeah, write to us at podcast at artstation.com or support at artstation.com and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, this episode um, was a fun one uh, with Sebastian. Yeah, it's, I mean, we're in a very lucky position. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we spoke to Teddy from Quicksource. So to see, be able to speak to the other half of the sort of the texture inside of the industry um, was very, I mean, it's a very lucky opportunity we had. But yeah, speaking to Sebastian about, kind of how how he developed um the substance pipeline and the substance tools because he i mean anyone who knows sebastian knows he's kind of an academic at heart um mm-hmm. he's a very technical guy so developing tools very technical tools to be used by artists is cool hearing his perspective on how he did that and the way he had to collaborate with other people and also like seeing hearing how he introduced substance into AAA gaming, how we had to reach out to certain studios and kind of sell them the idea of that this pipeline is worth investing in mm-hmm. was really interesting. For me personally, you know, being a games artist, it was really cool hearing that backstory behind, you know, how he got substance out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was that was a fun point of the conversation. We were like that that when we were talking about the studio workflow and the the key turning point for algorithmic at the time. That was fun to to hear directly from him. Um, I, as usual, like I like hearing about those that are building businesses and what the challenges that they've uh, that they've had to overcome. So we we can all learn from them. Um, and we talk about those things. Um, yeah, just a really nice conversation with Sebastian uh, from his home. Um, and um, yeah, we hope you enjoyed the conversation. Hi, Sebastian. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks. Thank you for having me. That's great. Ok, alors pour cet épisode, on va le faire complètement en français. Ça, ça te va, ça? <rire> ouais, ça me va bien. Moi, je veux bien le faire en français. Il n'y a aucun problème. <rire> Alex, toi, c'était correct avec ça? <rire> Dude, you can't do this with English. We only really, really speak one language. <rire> all right, all right, all right. So, for you, we'll, we'll, we'll change to English. So, first of all, I want to say thank you to you because from the very beginning of Art Station, uh, you've been one of our, of our biggest supporters. Uh, we used to meet with you often and uh, you give us feedback on the platform. You've always been there to answer our questions. And um, yeah, without people like you, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today. So, I want to say, I want to start by uh, a special thanks to you. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, I mean, I've been, I've been watching you guys grow and 
and like crazy. It's it's an incredible success actually. So yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you 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 have the success, and I wish you the best for 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 that. <laughs> and thanks <laughs> thanks for that, but thanks for the nice words. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Um, all right. I'd like to take things back uh, to the beginning. Uh, what we now know is the start of all of this. You were working on some mathematics research, and as part of uh, that was as part of your PhD. Uh, you also saw what was done with Jurassic Park, from what I understand, and then a light bulb went off. Is that is that accurate? It's uh, yeah. I mean, like the light bulb, like it was every day a new light bulb. Basically, I've been always passionate about everything, like computers and uh, games and movies, and VFX, and I've been like always like yeah, very um, enthusiastic about all that. And so Jurassic Park was one of the big shock in my life, but there, there has been more and it has been Terminator, Terminator 2. And there's been like uh, computer games, obviously, like in my first Apple IIc or my TI-99 Texas instrument a long time ago, a really long time ago, my Atari ST. So it was my, it was my, in my crib, in my small room when I was a kid, I grew up with all this surrounding me, like everything I could find techno- that was like technological, I would like jump on it basically. And so I've always been super interested by all this. And um, like when, you, if you talk specifically about my my PhD, yes, like actually before before starting my starting my PhD, I, I tried um, I joining a um, film school. So I wanted to become a director <laughs> because because I've been directing movies as well. I've been writing. I've been doing a lot of things on the side. And I was always hesitant between like these two careers, like an art career or a science career. And um, so I got rejected from the school and I could not enter, but I got like um, a grant from the French Ministry of Research to do my uh, PhD because I, I, I graduated like with honors and everything. So they told me like, you, we pay you for, for your PhD. So so I picked that that path, but basically when I, when I was doing my PhD and it was like, yeah, um, applied math and uh, computer computer science. Um, I also started teaching Softimage uh, 3D, and that was that was the big the big software package at the time, the, the biggest uh, 3D software package at the time. And it was like late 90s, and so I I I, I teached I was teaching this, and I was the one used on Jurassic Park among other things, right? And so, but when I was teaching that, that soft, that piece of software, I realized that um, what you could find in the software as features for the rendering part, especially the textures part, was actually very, uh, very much relying a lot, a lot relying a lot on the noise functions and 2D noise functions. And these textures actually were exactly looking like what I was actually generating with my mathematical model, I was working on for different purpose, which has which was uh, simulating uh, physically realistic clouds on a computer, and but I was looking at like noise functions, right? And so we had we had been working on this new way of creating and and and, and describing noise functions using wavelet wavelet approach, uh, uh, self similar processes, fractals. Anyway, so it was. It was this that led me to say, okay, well, maybe I can tweak my little prototype. Uh, and that was called The Art of Noise, Theon. So that was, I wrote that. The Art of Noise was the name of the prototype, like in the late 90s. And I, I tweaked it so that I could actually generate the textures I could find in Softimage and more. And so this is where I started to think, okay, maybe there is something to do here. And that could be combining my both my passions, like science, uh, what I was working on and, and art, like the art of visual effects. So I, I, what I did is I, I, I did my f- first uh, presentation in this, in this field of visual effects and it got picked up and, and, and seen by the head of uh, R&D from a Buf company, uh, B-U-F. And they were working on like uh, super great shows. Uh, they were working on uh, the Matrix 2 and 3, I think, uh, uh, Panic, Panic House, um, oh, Panic Room, Panic Room, sorry, uh, from uh, Fincher. Anyway, so that, that, that was uh, a great, great um, a studio at the time. And then basically, I understood that, uh, that that day, yes, maybe there is something to do with what I'm doing during my PhD as science and in that field that I love as a, as a, as a, as a geek, as an, as an artist, 
to some degree as well. And so maybe there is like a, this cross cross section of exploiting that technology for this form of art, which is the visual effects. And it was like the dream come true. And then I, I said, okay, maybe I want to do that. And I completed my PhD and the day after I started the company because I said, okay, this is what I want to do. Wait, so wait, wait, what was the year that, that so you said you finished your PhD? What year was that? So I completed my PhD end of 2001. So between 2001 to say like 2007. So one of the things I'm interested in mm-hmm. is when you came, when Substance came along and like really caught my eyes was during the kind of revolution into PBR technology. Yeah. Um, just talk us through from like that point of 2001 where you founded a company up until, you know, where Substance Painter really blew up. What did that look like? Because I, what I'm really curious about is I'm guessing it was going a particular way and then you saw PBR coming and you guys had to sort of pivot to jump onto that. So could you just talk us through that? Yeah, sure. I mean, like it's it's actually very funny because the the PBR revolution we didn't see it coming, but we were so prepared because like we've been we've been working like uh, from two thousand and and two thousand one to two thousand let's say eleven ish uh, almost working on Substance Designer and Teon like the the Art of Noise like the first one I wrote, then the third one became actually the basis of what you have inside of Substance Engine now. It's still like uh, this. There are still pieces of there uh, of that in there, uh, but written by way more talented uh, developers than me. So that's um, that's what happened. Like uh, when I started the company, I basically hired um, uh, a bunch of people, a bunch of super talented people, including one of my one of my students who's still here and who's the lead architect for everything substance, and is a incredibly talented uh, developer. So he, he rewrote all that. So what that means is when I started the company, it was nothing. A very few guys in a in a garage really like uh and coming up with something so it took a lot of time to come up with the first iteration of what would eventually become the substance engine so that was the beginning of it like the the technology piece and then on top of that we started building uh an app and an app that would become eventually substance designer right and the 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 very principle of uh, the substance engine and substance designer was to say Okay, we think we think procedural first, and we think uh, multi-channel, full materials, like something dedicated to materials, to digital materials. So at the time, it was not PBR; it was like the good old uh, um, diffuse, specular, uh, and normal. Uh, and normal just like happened uh, like late in that process, actually. So it was diffuse, no, diffuse, specular at best, or diffuse, but. We, we made it so that it was ready to, to deal with diffuse, specular, normal, and maybe more. And whatever the, the shader you would, you would use, so it was shader agnostic, it was really generating maps, texture maps, really, bitmaps in the end. So it was a procedural bitmap creation tool that would have like an engine that is separable so that the, the engine you could embed in your own game and regenerate these maps at runtime if you wanted to, but it was like too demanding, so very few people ended up doing that in the end. But so that means that during all that time between, let's say, 2001, 2002, 2002 and, and 2010, we, we'd been like working on this product without really like uh, reaching market fit. It was like uh, very few people would understand what we were doing. Like 2007, we started working with NVIDIA uh, and the Dassault system. Like very few companies like this who understood what we were doing, but we were so much in advance compared to <laughs> everything that was out there. So you had to be really yourself in advance to understand what was going on. So we started working with only the few, few companies here and there. And then what happened in 2010 is that the tool Substance Designer actually had like eight, almost eight years, let's say, long time of development behind its belt. And that means that when PBR uh, shading system and shading um, uh, methodology like uh, came out, we looked at it and we said, well, we can adapt to that new shading technique because we're shading a technique agnostic. So we could very quickly adapt. What does that mean for the maps that we need to generate? We need to have this and that and that. And we're ready, basically. <laughs> so when, when the first game developers started to uh, to say, okay, this this is the future. You, should, you guys should look into this. We were like, oh, but okay. Like in, in 10 minutes, we, we demonstrated, okay, you can tweak it like this and this. And then we wrote the first PBR shader so that you can visualize what was going on. And we, we basically, when 
saying outside and say, yeah, we're ready. And so because when as, as soon as the all the, 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 the studios out there started to look into new ways of creating the textures because that was what was impacted with the new uh, paradigm shift towards PBR, uh, we were in the in the back of the room saying, yeah, yeah we're ready. <laughs> but we didn't like envision it was it would be PBR, but we were agnostic and, and advanced enough uh, so that it, it worked like from uh, right away. But with that being said, I'm guessing when you're trying to get this incorporated into studios, I mean, I know what it's like in studios now, it's very hard to get people to pick up new pipelines and new tech because, you know, normally it's really built into the pipeline. Like it's not something that you could just interchange. Yeah. And I mean, even now you see new tech, new pipelines come out and, you know, there's always that discussion of like the old versus the new. Yeah. Now, when you guys are coming along with design now, everyone was thinking, oh no, we have to use ZBrush. That's how we make our textures. How much, like, how easy was it to get studios to sort of see the light of what this could be? Was it yeah. met with much resistance or was it like, oh no, this is exactly what we need? It was super hard. And, 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 and in this respect, we were fighting more against uh, Photoshop, in fact, okay. than, anything, than anything else. Uh, because Photoshop was and still is everywhere and everybody knows how to use it and everybody uses it still and it's super useful. And now it's part of like the family of the tools that, uh, for my company, that sounds great. But the really, it was like uh, to your point, like pipelines set uh, were set, and people knew how to do things. So if you, if somebody would have come to me and said, "Well, Seb, you've been doing that for ten years. You have, you're a master at what you're doing. Now forget everything and you need to do uh, use this other tool," I would like <laughs> laugh at that guy, of course. But there is, in retrospect, what what happened and what we followed very much was the 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 idea of uh, adoption. Of innovation, and it's it's an, a very documented process which starts with the techno lovers, early adopters, and then the curve goes like like it's a, it's a, a bell curve, and it, you have very little number of people first who are the early adopters and the technology lovers, and these guys will understand because they thrive at trying to find the next big thing, the next new technological. Uh, improvement and so they love it right away so it was a matter for us to find first these guys convince these guys that we were uh, it was working starting working with that so it was only a few guys in a, in, a, in a few studios really at first and then it started picking up and then you you get to a point where you, you reach the, the pragmatists and the followers and then you get more people but then there is a big gap between the the early adopters and the pragmatists called the the, the, the chasm and you have to cross the chasm and so it means that, and what that means, the chasm, what, the, what it means really is that the pragmatists, they don't trust the early adopters because they say, oh, you, you, you geeks. <laughs> so I don't want to hear about that. So you have to have a very dedicated strategy to prove the point by changing the way you present it, changing the way you demonstrate the impact you can have on your, on your, on your, on your studio. And it's, it's all documented. It's, uh, there is a lot of literature around it. But basically, we had to follow this path. And so the first ones to really dig into the tool were Naughty Dog. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, Naughty Dog was really one of the first ones, and because like they were the most like early adopters, only like future uh, focused. That, that was the perfect like it was a meeting made, made in made in heaven. And then a few people also at Ubisoft in in Annecy in France actually started using it as well. So it started with few people here and there, and then as soon as it was like production proof, pragmatists were reassured on the about the fact that, yes, you can use it in production. And then it's starting to blow completely because um, um, because everybody was like doing PBR fully now. There, there has been a transition phase, yes. So to your point, yes, it was super complicated, uh, but we've been lucky. And then we've been like surfing the wave of Substance Designer being ready for PBR. And then we started developing Substance Painter. Like it had been like a long process actually, but. And then Substance Painter appeared, and it was like exactly what people wanted that to, to, to see as well. So that like it picked up again. And then if you, I mean, in retrospect, if you look at the, the evolution of the, the revenue flow for the company, it was it's a, it's a beautiful hockey stick curve. So you 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 think it was like okay, we've been following your path, and then that, that's no no issue whatsoever. But it's been super complicated. But yes, it, it it's been following that path. In fact, did you? How were you getting? the voice of the customer did you have artists that you were bringing onto your team were you just building relationships with studios and artists individually to collect, collect feedback yeah we both uh, like from the staff from when the day i started the company I, I hired artists because i knew that i didn't want to do 
artists by engineers for engineers. I wanted to, to buy engineers and artists for artists. So the engineers at the end are not so much here anymore. <laughs> so they need to really understand the fact that, yeah, it's for an artist. And, and so it has to, has to be taken into account. So yeah, very quickly we had like intern, uh, int um, interns or like full-time uh, artists in, in, in the team very quickly. And then you, to your, to, to your point, Alex, like the, the early adopters, we, we, we started like developing like very strong relationship with some of them. Like some, some of the guys at Naughty Dog, for instance, it became like dear advocates and friends and like they helped us like stress us and like give us the, the, the reality of what the production entails really. And so that, that, that's, that was super helpful, but yeah, we've been super close all the time. We spent so many hours, countless hours and months and days and weeks and years, even like in, inside of the studios, trying to help and understand what's going on and having like people join from these studios or some of, some of our guys join studios as well. So that again, like explain, yeah, it happened several times actually. Huh. I didn't actually know that bit. I, I, what the one thing I find is is quite interesting is you're in. I would guess the best way to put it is an academic. Um, like I said, you did have like you had these creative interests and how like when you're developing a tool and I say they're for art. It's substance designer. If we're going to talk about that in isolation, it's kind of this weird blend of art because I mean I know when I was learning it, I opened it up and I was instantly like, yeah, this is for programmers, not for me. And it took a while to get into it until I watched other artists use it and show me the way. How, how, in the, and this is more talking to the early days when you're developing the tool, like it's the end product user you plan to use it as an artist. Is it what, how do you empathize with the artist to think, okay, this isn't for me as a, an engineer or as a programmer, this is for an artistic creative person? Mm -hmm. How do you bridge that gap? It's really about, about the, the, the way the, the, the team is structured and the very interest of the developers you hire. So like the team, to, uh, I was saying to, to Kevin, the, the basically very early on, we had like artists in the team. And so that means that this, what they were doing was uh, designing what they wanted to have. And then the engineers would implement that, discuss, say, oh, maybe you have a better idea. Because it turns out all the developers we have, not only are they really like super hardcore, incredibly talented uh, developers, like close to the metal, like really deep, deep, deep tech. But they also, most of the time, super passionate about computer graphics and art. And so they, they, they can, even if they cannot produce, they can uh, empathize with uh, uh, the users. And we, it's always been something that we've been very, very sensitive about, like hiring people who can empathize uh, with, uh, with the users. And, and so it's, it's, it's a matter also of us, like uh, choosing the right people to, to, work at, to work in the company. So they're developers, they're extremely good at what they're doing, but also they are very extremely good at working with the artists and working for the artists and understand and, and loving what, the, what they produce really. And most of, that, most of our users, most of our developers are gamers or, like if, or, or, or passionate about um, um, visual effects. Uh, or 3D, 3D at large, or sometimes artists themselves, like a lot of them like do music. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It's actually very interesting. Like it's a good bunch of, uh, of people. So it's a matter of, the, of uh, the chemistry of the team and the way it's functioning. So the artists don't, don't have the power. The engineer don't have the power. It's a, it's a matter of like them talking really and finding the, the best solution. Like a good example I can give you is the UDIM support. Like we released lately. Like a lot of years, we've heard people saying, "Well, in Substance Painter, you have to have this. You have to support UDIMs and paint. Do do, do like Mario." And we've been working on that, and, and the guys have been like really wrapping their heads about around. Okay, what does that mean really when it comes to workflow? And it's not UDIMs only. It's UV tiles. It's more general, and so that led to many other. Uh, um, improvements outside of this very specific feature, not just uh, uh, memory management uh, ways of uh, like managing the UVs and 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 it's it has and, and also the, the workflow the, the global workflow is actually way more general than only UDIM. So now it's it's opening up like new ways of creativity for more people than only the people interested in having this, this very specific feature. So th this is. I like to think this is because of the way the team is structured and um, the quality of the team, of course. So let's, um, I'm curious about uh, bringing us to what you were saying before about uh, Naughty Dog starts using it and uh, probably that's syncing up with when PBR is, 
is starting to take off, then is that a moment at the company where there's a there's another like key inflection point where now you might be visiting many studios and trying to get integrated uh, th- throughout the industry. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That that was that was crazy. Like when as soon as you pass the actually cross the, the chasm and everybody wants to use it, it becomes a matter of like uh, almost just visiting the studios. If if not, maybe sometimes even not necessary. Sometimes we we, we started like getting inbound uh, requests for for sales. Like uh, whereas before it would have necess- necessitated uh, that we 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 would visit the studios. We, we visited all the studios in the world, pretty much. All the triple A studios we visited, all of them. <laughs> and so, like every time we would visit them, we would sell a few licenses first at first, and then it started to be like, okay, now we want to ditch completely this way of doing, and this is substance. And now substance is everywhere. When it comes to like game development studios, there are very, very, very few studios that don't use them, like very few. And uh, in VFX, it's starting to be uh, to be very, very uh, um, present as well. But what happened also, what is interesting is that the, the, the pragmatists I was mentioning before, they talk between pragmatists of different environments. And so what we've seen happening without us pushing for it like very hard was the pragmatists of, let's say, uh, uh, industrial design firm, uh, automotive company, come to us and say, okay, we want to use uh, game development uh, tools for our next design pipeline, next gen design pipeline for the next cars that we want to design. And so I've asked my friends in this gaming industry, that my pragmatist friends, what tools I should use. And all the time it would be, Substance would be in that list because it was used by all these game developers. So we started also seeing an impact in these other areas. And now it's, it's, it's starting to represent like a, a lot the fashion, of uh, the fashion industry. Fashion industry, you've seen like us uh, working a lot on this. It's actually picking up so quickly. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to witness like, uh, the need for 3d is everywhere. And because we've been successful in setting this, the, the market really for in, in one specific area that is regarded as the most advanced and the one that we want to replicate, it's, it's benefiting, benefiting us a uh, big time right now. I think it's quite clever, actually, when you mentioned it about them, the, the trendsetters, the guys who are early adopters. I think it, it's quite telling. So you see stuff like the Signature Series, which um, for a lot of people, for the people like me at the time who were kind of non-believers of design now, they know it's, it's, a, it's a programmer's tool. The fact that you guys run these schemes where it's like, okay, we're going to go find a superstar artist, someone like Chris Hodgson from Noy Dog, uh, Ben Wilson, any of these kinds of guys, and like, Show us what you could do with design Just Create a set, of, a series of materials, and really show the world what you can do. Now, that isn't like a, you know, oh, you could do that in your work time or anything like that. It's like this is you showing how good the tool is, yeah. and them kinds of things. I know it's what opened my eyes up to it. It was like seeing Chris Hodgson do this sort of stuff, and I was like, mm-hmm. I need to take this seriously. If he's doing this and he's able to achieve this, I need to start paying attention. And I love the fact that that's almost how, from what I've observed with my generation, is the design that became more and more popular is just, oh, this really amazing artist picking up, oh, that one's doing it. It's like, it kind of spread almost word of mouth. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And we've been we've been lucky to have like sites like our station, like showcasing that as well, right? So it's, it's actually great to see a place like this where artists can express themselves and, and showcase what they're doing. And it benefited the whole industry. It's, it's a matter of an ecosystem where we're not like uh, we were talking about that just before. We're not in isolation. It's it's a matter of uh, nurturing an ecosystem of creators. What is mi- what is needed? What is what is making sense? What is helping? What is inspiring? And uh, art session has been playing such a big role in there for substance designer first, and then for substance painter. What one thing I'd like to mention here is the we we very much cherish this idea of like separating. And I wrote a, an internal white paper about it, but basically this idea of like left brain, right brain artists. Uh, I don't like, I don't, I hear a lot of the time I hear people, I've been hearing like people saying, okay, um, the technical artists, they are technical, it's great, but they, they're, what they're producing is looking crap most of the time <laughs> and, or vice versa, the artists, they don't, they're producing cool stuff, but they don't know what they're doing. So it's non-technical. And I, I've always like despised this separation in, in terms of talent where really it's not a, it's not an axis that is important. The important uh, axis is 
to me, the approach, and this is why I, I wanted to have this separation between left brain and right brain, which is the same approach, like for the same output, which is a texture, maybe you want to use a different path. A different path is maybe a graph. Maybe you think about your process and you, you lay it down such, in, in such a way that it's, it's, it looks like a graph in your head and then you project it and, onto, onto Substance Designer. It makes sense. But then also you can just, you, 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 you will sometimes you just want to, and some people prefer them to work that way, actually, to try on an error, right? To do work on the thing and then come up with something that makes sense and inspiring. It's, it's, it's very, it's more, it's more organic and more, uh, and less, uh, less, uh, uh, systemic, I would say. And so by having two tools, Substance Designer and Painter, we actually embraced that separation and we say, okay, Substance Designer for the left brain artist, right? Substance Painter is for the right brain artist. And when we, when you actually embrace that separation, you can actually make it so that you focus really on one or the other, right? It's not like one do it all. This is why this is why like pe- tools like that are very advanced technical will have a hard time like uh, picking up uh, more steam and, and 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 reach more people in the end, really, because it's too much. It's too much. It's and and, and most of the guys don't want to hear to, to to get into that because it's the the learning curve is too high or the the cost of using it is is too high because it's actually not fitting the way you think. Whereas a painter, you can pick it up, have fun, paint, and start producing cool stuff. And you use the recipes that have been designed by the, the Substance Designer guys. And then this is where the ecosystem again works. Because like the Substance Designer guys will create recipes of procedural uh, content that can use, be used by then the, the Substance Painter artists and, and tweaked and, and painted over. So you can do your own, but you have a base, you save time. So it saves you time versus saves you um, uh, versus the scales, right? It's different, different uh, objective here. So you mentioned ecosystems as quite a fitting word for what I want to ask you. It's we know the substance doesn't operate within a vacuum. We know there's other software out there which is similar, like something like Quixel. Um, now, what I want to know is, and the reason I ask this is, every time we speak to people, you see people talk either at conferences or on podcasts like these. We tend they we tend to talk as if the other companies don't exist. So. With, with the relationship between Substance and Quixel, how much do you, do, do you think we observe each other? You know, as in Quixel makes a move and you might go, okay, have we, do we need to rethink what we're doing? Are we going in the right direction? And not necessarily, you know, make you act on it, but you have to think or vice versa. Like how much, and also you mentioned off air as well, like the, the fact that these, there's like a healthy competition, you, I guess you push each other. Um, I just want to hear you talking a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. I mean, like, yeah, competition is always a good thing, especially when the market itself is growing. And that means that it's not like a zero sum game, right? When, when there is a zero sum game, it's, it becomes a, a game that is more like of a, of a battle. And I understand actually when companies try to be protective and, uh, try to not give too much, right? Because it's, it's, it's a matter of life or, or, or death. So it's, uh, we're, we're not in that situation here. Like three days growing. Right, and it's been growing for the from for the past for the past ten years or fifteen years, twenty years even, uh, and will it will keep growing because the the, the need for three D content is is still here and will be here. So yes, there has been competition. We've seen uh, uh, we when when I started the company, there were there were a few already here. There were there was a um, plugin. There were plugins for for Photoshop at the time. I remember. Um, uh, I don't know if I remember some, something called Dark Tree. Uh, that was uh, that was interesting. It was like a four year based uh, approach. Uh, it was uh, uh, it was it was cool. I, I loved all this, right? Because this is this is what I looked at when I started my com- my own company, saying, "Well, I want to do cool stuff like this." Right? So not only is it important to to keep that in mind, not to to to, to come and say, "Well, we not only we invest in everything, or we don't we don't look at what's happening because it's not true." We looked at what was there before going in there, right? And and then we when when we developed ourselves, we saw some coming, including Quixel and, and, and others, but there are there has been others. Um and 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 sometimes they inspire you and sometimes they they are inspired. Yes, obviously we, we looked at what we're doing all the time and we looked at the industry not only because we're passionate, but because sometimes yeah they're good ideas and because it's 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 the way it's the way things go, especially um Especially when when we see in in some areas that we're lacking some features, mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And it makes sense for people to stick, to keep working with one or the other or both. And when, when there's still space and for both, it's, it's the best, right? It's, it's what we're seeing now. Um, and then we, we all know each other, right? Obviously. And, and sometimes we, it's, it's a, I would say it's a healthy competition when we know each other, we, we tease our, uh, each other. Obviously we, we like to, well, we like to, we like to, sh- let me show you what we can do, right? <laughs> Of course, we like to do that, but in the end, we drink beers together and we 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 we, we meet and it, it's cool because we we love the same art. We still love the very same art. And if you if you there is rivalry, but I like to think that right now there is not like a a, a deadly one. Like it's it, it's uh yeah, it's at least not not coming from us. It's not it's not our intent. Like yeah, and yeah, and we were like I don't know if you're following the the uh, um live stream on, on Wednesday, we've been asked that question, like with the UDIMs now, what do you think? Can you do everything Mari is doing? And the honest answer is maybe not. Maybe if you want to have like really thousands of UDIMs, maybe this is, this will be tough for you. But if you, but for, we believe that for 90 plus 99% of the cases, you should be using, you, now you should be using Substance Painter because we feel like it's a, it's better suited for, for UDIMs now. But uh, maybe a few cases here and there. Yes, I have to admit. Yeah, Mario has been like thought of from the start, from the ground up, and it, it's using a technology that is different from ours that allows for this specifically. It's limiting in in other ways, but it's not. It's it's allowing in 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 this for, for some like very specific uh, application. So yeah, I mean, like to to your point, we don't we don't live in a vacuum, and we. We've always tried to integrate our technology into as many tools as possible, so that like the content flows. So you're not stuck. It's not our intent to have like a closed environment at all. Not our intent. What, what we want to do for sure is to be a one-stop shop. If you if you go for Substance by Adobe, you have everything you need. Of course, we want that. But that doesn't mean that it's at the at the at the cost of saying it's either this or nothing, mm-hmm. right? Uh, or, or like it's one or the other. Yeah, it's not one or the other. I agree with you. We're we're, we're very much like and and three D is such in its infancy uh, still. Like uh, the, there is not even like a, a good exchange um, file format. Uh, really, <laughs> there is not even like a, a, a standards like uh, that, are, um, that are good enough. Really, like it's 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 in the works, but we're at that stage where we still need to to work and. Every time we visit like the studios, they have like different pipelines, and so we have to say, okay, oh yeah, you you're doing this, so let's let's adapt this. And I and to your point, like if you if you mention like mega scans, mega scans plus substance is a great combination. Yes, amazing. It's, it's amazing, right? It works. We have substance source as well because we have to have something, but we're not saying like we, substance source. You don't need a mega scan. We don't we don't say that. We never said that. We we say mm-hmm. with substance source and substance, you have a great thing already. It's great. It's, uh, and it's different, and it's uh, for this and that reason. It's, it's yeah, it's one, one of the things you mentioned, uh, which I found to be true as well, is the is the camaraderie within our industry that that it is so small. And when I go to conferences and chat with uh, with artists, be from different different studios or different companies, I've seen it myself. Like we all have this passion for the industry that we're in. We love it. We 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 we're fans. Also, at the end of the day, yeah, like some yeah. of the stuff we we see, and um, yeah, it's 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 really comforting. It's I think it's an industry that's uh, not like a lot of others uh, in the world. We're lucky. Um, we're lucky. It's going well. And yeah, the, especially gaming industry right now. Right now, yeah. Yeah, and uh, one of the reasons why I look forward to conferences and and things coming back is getting together with everybody. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> How much I miss well. y'all. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> You mentioned that one one of the struggles was uh, adapting to changing pipelines in the studios. Is is that like the maybe most challenging uh, one of your yeah. biggest challenges over over the in, in the recent yeah. times? Yeah, absolutely. Because because it's 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 a high it's at a high stake for the for the studios. So again, if you if you'd ask me, well, change the way you work, it will be better. Trust me. Uh, I would I would be reluctant at first, right? So it'd be uh, I'm a I'm kind of an early adopter myself, so I'd like to to blow things up, but uh, but uh, still, like it's um, 
we have to, I have to respect that. It makes it makes perfect sense. Uh, like the mathem- mathematician in me, like uh, <laughs> the computer scientist in me says, yeah, it makes sense. It's logical, right? So you can start with a few guys here and there and prove the point, and then you 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 go on a bigger project, and then you eventually you you use it for all the project. But it's 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 a process, and it, it's it's a journey. It's a journey. You you cannot like uh, have uh, shortcuts. Unless you've been successful, as I was saying, into other areas and that new areas want to just adopt the actual pipeline that they're using, become then it becomes the starting pipeline becomes the pipeline that includes you. So that's that's where you're very, very strong. So it it, it will be super complicated to displace us the same way right now, because substance is so much in, in there that like any other tool that comes in and says, uh, yeah, you should do it differently. I don't see many by right now, but still, like, if, if there was an incumbent, it would be difficult for, for this incumbent as well for, for, for that very reason. And but I, it's called disruption. It happens, so that that can happen. We did it, so it can happen to us as well. So that means that we need to be careful. Anyway, I, I guess one question I do have for you, and I'm not sure what you could say to it is. PBR came along and it it really shook up the industry. I mean, it changed the fundamentals of how we create art and. I fit as an as the ignorant majority looking from the outside in when we saw the stuff like UE5 come out with all the buzzwords they threw around. The things that went through my head was okay, I struggle as it is to handle some of the files I'm handling. These, you know, 30 million polygon assets or these 8K textures. And then, you know, UE5 come along and they throw all these buzzwords, infinite polygons, infinite textures, infinite draw calls. Do you have you guys, I'm guessing algorithmic already looking at okay there is another shift coming something's going to give because we can't continue the way that we've been producing art and creating art and implementing it sustainably at scale with what's good to come is that something you guys have got like one eye on um or you know is there anything you could speak to about that of course yeah you yeah, know we've been looking at this and um it's great. I mean, it's 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 uh, for, for once for Substance Painter with the new UDIM system, it's great because uh, you you still need to texture these guys, and uh, maybe you do a vector vector uh, the text painting, and then yes, of course. But but then but then it's a matter of like uh, uh, upstream how you manage all that data anyway. So it's it it doesn't make sense for ninety nine point nine percent of the time to just go crazy. Because yeah. by definition, it's going crazy, right? So you you don't want to forget again that that will take time be, 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 between now and the time it becomes like a, the the way to go. It will take a lot of time, and then we will will adapt, obviously. But yeah, I mean, we have a tool like uh, called Medium that allows you to to sculpt and do a, a crazy number of polygons if you want to. Uh, and we 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 um, we start looking into uh, capture and procedural modeling. And so, yeah, you can, you absolutely, you can go crazy. It's, it's a matter of like, what tools will you use to create that content anyway? And if in the end of the process, like it can be um, managed and eaten up by a tool like UE5 or others that can ingest that level of complexity, great. I mean, that means that it gives maybe potential, maybe more, more freedom. We'll see. But uh, what we, what we're certain uh, is that we, we want to still be able to smartly manage without having to impose a burden on the users, on the artists. We want to manage that complexity and make it like manageable by everyone. And so that then you have many, many different applications. So this extreme cases is extreme. So by definition, it's still like super niche and very top of the pyramid. And if it trickles down, we'll see. Uh, I, I, I doubt it will be overnight first and mm-hmm. then uh, then, then it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's a matter of it's it's almost like one new platform to address for us, right? Right. Okay. Almost, almost like that, right? So, but that's that's great. I mean, we've always been um, shading agnostic and and w- uh, way of uh, uh, visualizing agnostic. Let's say, let's put it this way. And so that separation is very important, and we want to keep that. So we want to to address UE five and the. The technologies like this, yes, of course, absolutely, it's great, it's awesome, I love it. And but we also want to keep like to keep working with the rest. So if you design once, you have like your content flow everywhere first. And if you want to go crazy, go crazy. Yes, that's the freedom we want to to uh, to give to to the users. And today it's crazy, but maybe in five years it's like not crazy anymore. It's like the new norm, but it will take time. 
What is this out of curiosity as well with the upscale? So one thing you've, I guess, with design, and I keep coming back to design. So I guess that's where it all started. In that, it's all mathematical based. It's where I guess we started to really see procedural tech um, come into the mainstream. I guess best way to describe it: you know, you know, procedural textures rather than sculpted textures. Procedural rather than hand painted. How just on that front, ignoring I guess the, um, the 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 software, the application side of things, just that idea of procedural. Considering it's still met resistance these days, you still see artists who are um, not in favor of it because it's like, oh, you lose the, the soul of the art to use a uh, cliche. How much? I mean, did people even oppose it back? Yeah, you know, when you were first talking about it, or was it a case of we don't know what it is, so it's like you know. It's just they, they're kind of ignorant to it. What was the reception to just the whole notion of proced- procedural art? So that's interesting because like the, the very word procedural, uh, we stopped using it at some point. I don't know if you noticed that was one of part of the strategy for crossing the chasm. But uh, that, that that worked. And now we use it again because we've understood what we're doing between the left brain and right brain artists. The left brain artists they don't mind. Actually, it's a plus to hear that word. <laughs> that's comforting. Exactly, it's, it's it's great, and I understand why. And and uh, whereas substance painter, it's a different beast. Really, it's very procedural itself. Like you 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 can use it completely procedurally, but you cannot export the procedural uh, recipe. Whereas for substance designer, you can do that. And actually, actually, one of the things we had to face when we started uh, pushing substance designer was, um, to your point. And it's like some people were doing shaders and doing coding. I mean, we're coding like uh, procedural textures. Um, so yeah, so you, you you would have like all these people like uh, programming shaders and programming uh, procedural textures. And so the 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 very idea of the word what would as, be associated with the word procedural was runtime procedural textures. And so we we had to fight actually a lot against. This idea of okay, this is for runtime applications only, and we have to we had to really fight a lot to say well, actually you can bake out the textures, so it's a procedural bitmap generator. Mm. If you want to keep the recipe live, you can do it, and you can do runtime applications and runtime generations of these bitmaps. But you will always have bitmaps in the end, and that was like super hard for a lot of people to understand. Oh, but you're losing the interest of procedural. Yes, to some degree. But you are also gaining the the power of expression that comes with the very techniques that we're using in Substance Designer, which which allows for uh, work and blurs and that kind of thing that were super hard to do, like uh, with uh, with Fourier based uh, uh, approaches and good old like uh, procedural techniques. So <clears throat> we we were giving up the pure the pure the purity of the procedural approach for uh, a, a better expressive, uh, an inc- improved expressive power. I don't know if I'm clear, but, but anyway, so we had to fight a lot with that. So, and yeah, today again, like, uh, absolutely. We, 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 we meet people who like, look at the tool, like, whoa, 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 what is, what is that? But then we, it's fine. It's, uh, you're not like brand artist. Fine. You, there are other ways to, to create the, the, the content and you have substance painter for that or alchemist. I mean, I'm glad you mentioned that, to be honest, because it's it's one of the things that I spent I spend a lot of time talking to artists, um, trying to learn from them. And one of the things I learned from a lot of material artists is if you try to you stick to the whole notion of procedural, you can run into walls. And it it took me a long time. I mean, when I first picked up designer, it was like I had this notion in my head, it had to be hundred percent designer, hundred percent designer. Mm-hmm. And I ran into brick walls and it wasn't until the someone explained to me that you have to, or is to augment your workflow. It's a workflow, not a pipeline. And it's like, okay, so using outside resources, whether it's blender stuff, whether it's, um, even mega scans, I've used mega scan stuff, um, in designer to like help cross the gaps, which are, are difficult. It's interesting that you, I, I didn't actually know that, that you, you tried to, you guys phased out the word procedural and now you explain it. It's like, okay, I, I kind of get it just for those. So I understand what you mean by runtime procedural, but just for those who are listening, could you just like to explain what runtime procedural is for the differences between that and traditional? Yeah. So runtime procedural, procedural is the, the fact that when you actually play the game, uh, there is the engine 
uh, part of the engine is dedicated to generating um, the colors of and all the shader information for, for a given materials. So but at every frame, every frame, you compute all the, the information for uh, a given material. So you never have bitmaps in the end. Yeah. It's all like shader information, right? So this, this is the runtime, the runtime aspect. You, you can have bitmaps. It can be runtime bitmap generation. So that means that before actually applying that texture, these, these bitmaps onto an object, you can run a process that generates all these bitmaps for you. And we, ha we have that. So you can use today the Substance Engine to do that if you want to. So it could be useful for uh, many purposes, but it's, it's costly. Uh, and if you want to get rid of, uh, if, the, if you want to ex um, exit the world of uh, runtime processes, you do what we call offline. What you do is you use Substance Designer. Inside there is uh, this, uh, this runtime of, uh, uh, engine that generates the, the bitmaps. When they're done, they're done. And when you change something, they regenerate everything. And but at the end, it's it's a bunch of bitmaps. You what you export from that, you do export. You can just export uh, PNGs or or TGAs or whatever TIFFs if you want, and uh, and then use that as regular images that you would have produced using Photoshop or something else. So that's the difference. Uh, I guess this is a fully, this is just a curious question. I guess with you and your team, do is there a temptation like you're obviously the tools you're developing is for an end purpose, a workflow, like for example, just for argument's sake, games, and a you know a runtime procedural is not work is not a viable option for say games for the most part. Mm -hmm. Is there a is there like a part of you that's still like yeah, but for the sake of tech, you know, like for 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 tech's sake, like we could do this, okay, yeah, but that isn't very functional for us to build this game. Yeah, but it's really cool that we could do this. Like, oh, is, yeah. is there a part of you that still wants to look at that side of stuff? Big, big time, big time. I'm a. <laughs> I've always been trying to push that, like from like from 2001, basically, I've been saying, oh, this is the future for this and that reason. And one of the reasons was, yeah, the procedural aspect to it, like uh, customization, uh, live environments, like live textures. Let's say an explosion happens somewhere, it doesn't change, it does change in the, the very textures according to the physics. So you could, you could plug all this, you could have a very physical environment include up to the very surfaces. And so there has been demos, there has been a few games here and there exploiting this, not that many. But yeah, to me, maybe maybe I will have to wait for the next um, computational uh, uh, leap, right? Because uh, maybe we need more power, we need more uh, VRAM, we need more, or well, something completely different than VRAM. <laughs> we, need, we need everything, right? Or maybe it's the cloud, maybe it's every device on the planet can, can compute at the same time for you when you play your game. I don't know what, what the future holds, but or you have like in your in your brain a little chip that produces the same amount of uh, computational power than uh, all the computers on the planet right now, maybe. We don't know, right? So so at that time, maybe everything's possible and everything should be dynamic. So at least we're ready for that. Like So maybe, so the same way we've been ready for the PBR when it happened, maybe we're ready for the runtime completely fully physical, fully dynamic environment revolution when it comes as well. Absolutely. I'm excited by that as well. But it might be a long shot. <laughs> Personally, like on a personal basis, uh, like what are you excited about uh, the, uh, that could happen in the near future, both either with games or with film that personally yeah, you're excited about? I would say the... It's not necessarily games or film, actually. Uh, a little bit film. But the I, I see... 3D becoming, um, I mean, going everywhere. Like uh, when I when I when I when I want to brag a little bit <laughs> internally, uh, always suddenly sometimes I say that we that my 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 division at 3D immersive division at uh, at Adobe, I see it as the electric vehicle division hmm. uh, of Adobe. And it's, it's electric vehicles. So that means that we have to, to start almost from scratch. It's still very in its infancy. It's still very technological. Um, so we focus on the engines. We focus on the very vehicles. We focus on what like, that means really for uh, transportation or for, in, that, in our case, for design. But the same way, I don't see any vehicle in 20 years not being powered by an electric engine. I don't... I don't see the future of design not being powered to some degree by a 3D engine 
right? Yeah. Or interactive 3D engine and immersive. So yes, immersivity like VR, AR to me is a, is a space of a very, very uh, strong interest. Uh, it's still very niched, niche right now. Not niche, <laughs> not, the, not the writer. Very niche right now. But the but I see a tremendous uh, opportunity here uh, when we have the form factors and when it's spread uh, enough. And the first form factor, it, 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 the same way for the for the i um, for the uh, iPhone, it uh, it became interesting uh, starting the, the third generation, right? It will be the third generation. But it will certainly take time for the AR, for AR to be really like widespread. VR is really already something really really cool and really immersive and really bringing new ways of being creative and experiencing uh, things. But the web, everything, so everything 3D, interactive, uh, is going to be everywhere. So I'm, I'm super excited about this. And I, I'm seeing 3D and all the techniques that come from the games industry starting to be applied uh, in environments like uh, shopping, uh, uh, industrial design. Like when you design you the next BMW, you want this interactive experience. You, you will be playing Forza, and, and it looks amazing in Forza. I want that when I'm designing my new BMW. Why don't? Why do I have to wait for something that is not real time or something? Yeah. So uh, an interactive. Why can't I start a start up the, the the car and hear the engine and start driving? So you have to have this. So yeah, all of this and virtual production, same thing. Like uh, for visual effects, like what we're saying is that it's more and more. Fully virtual, fully distributed, by the way, because of the COVID situation. We're all working from home. So that's great to see, um, like in the next iteration of Medium, we, we re I mean, the team re-integrated uh, this, uh, this ability to work like uh, remotely and in teams. So you're in the same VR room and you work on this thing together. And that's great. So that, that all this seem, is exciting to me. And back to my point where, where when I was talking about the competition and ec ecosystem, um, it's growing. Mm -hmm. So we, all of us as an industry, will have to invent all that together, and that's great. And the, the winner, there will be winners, and will be like less winners. But I, I don't see any big losers in there, really. Um, so that's great. I feel good about that, and we're lucky again, like super lucky. And I mean, it's uh, it's great. Like, uh, we, we we have to be fortunate and, and think about this uh, for a minute because definitely, like, there are many people in in, in trouble right now. So and. and our industry is spared for the for the most part, so that's great. But yeah, I mean, like when it comes to the future, um, yeah, many things <laughs> got me uh, keep me uh, up at night, uh, as you can tell. Maybe it I'm, seems I'm, like yeah, it seems like you might not sleep very much at night. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I, I have this superpower, which is I forget everything. So when I sleep, that means that every day is like a, a rediscovery of. Right. The thing I was, I was thinking the, the last day. So basically, the excitement of last day was like every day is like, oh yeah, I was, oh yeah, that's great. <laughs> so that superpower of forgetting everything, like coming from part of my uh, uh, brain accident, uh, whatever, uh, different story. But yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I've I've had a chance to hang out with uh, with people from your team as well, and it seems like that's like part of the culture of the team as well. Just being always being excited about what's happening right now. And then, uh, yeah, being excited about what's coming up. Yeah, you, it's very, 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 very cool and um, good to be yeah. a part of. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have the best team, I have to say. The, the, the team is pff, incredible. And yeah, to your point, like they're always like uh, looking for the next the next thing. We, we're not like uh, sleeping all hours. I, I've, mm -hmm. I've been like hearing and reading a lot of um, anxiety when we sold to Adobe. And I understand yeah. that again. It's a big, big company. Mm -hmm. I speak about the substance team here, but I can tell you, like the dimension team is same as us, uh, medium team is same as the substance team, and so together we. And actually, everybody at Adobe is like very passionate about what they're doing, mm -hmm. and and now that we're here, now that we have this big opportunity, this big um, um, team, um, bigger team now. It's yeah, I mean, like we're we haven't released that amount of new features and technologies ever. <laughs> We've mm -hmm. been accelerating the pace, actually. Um, and there is so much, like on, on, on Wednesday during the live stream, I was talking about like a bit, bit of uh, what we're doing with Adobe Research and internally as well. And it's so exciting. Yeah, I mean, like uh, we're all here because we're passionate. Most of most of the, the people here, we say, are passionate about what we're doing. So that's uh, 
You mentioned at the beginning, but maybe, uh, but not by name. So I give you a chance just to talk about some of the the early staff that you had uh, brought on board and the mm-hmm. yeah, who who are still with you today that have had a big impact. Yeah. Well, that's uh, yeah. I, his name is Christoph. It's funny because like uh, when he was a student of mine, like at first uh, I was uh, I was teaching him. I was teaching him, but he knew everything. So I was not teaching really because he knew everything. Um, but uh, it's funny because uh, he introduced me to a lot of animes first. Mm-hmm. <laughs> serial. Mm-hmm. I remember Serial Experiment Lane, for example. For example, is one of the ones like he he, he gave me like all these pirated CDs <laughs> or the whole series, and I would watch it, and I was like, okay, that's awesome. And in exchange, I would explain to him like what I was doing in my PhD, and um, he then like accepted to to join. And I remember actually when he was a student, like for the little story, let me give you a little story. He was being called by the other, the other students, he was being called God. And uh, somewhere I was asking the guys, why do you call him God? And I was saying, because he knows to do, he knows how to do everything. Right. He can do everything. Right. Right. And I was like, okay, I need to talk to that guy. I started talking. I was like, oh, wow, he's super smart. <laughs> he knows, he knows a lot of things in the end. And uh, so I was, yeah, okay. So again, like com- comparison, but I don't, I don't like that much. But anyway, but anyway, I, I was looking for like a super talented, um, close to the machine type of genius. And by the way, I've seen like all in all these the companies I've seen that have been successful. There is at least one person that is, who's Clearly exceptional, exceptional. Like it's, I've, I've really seen like um, companies succeeding without like uh, this uh, extra talent. Yeah. So this is the most important thing you want to you want to do if you want to start a company. Yeah, I mean, find find your find your genius, <laughs> find your genius yeah. in your team, and then it will do ten times bigger and better than you imagine in the first place because I would come with ideas, I would come with my formula and say, well, you have to implement this. This is what we want to do. And I was like, yeah, we could do this or that and then we could do better and then then it does better and then you're like, okay, perfect. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah, absolutely. So where are the best places for people to uh, to keep up to date on things? Uh, like, oh, well, a lot of people who are listening to the to this will already know, but um, you have your personal Twitter that you're, you're quite mm-hmm. active on. That's one thing. But then there's also uh, substance3d.com. Yep. Uh, there's the Academy that, yep. that people can, there's lots of great learning content on there. Substance mm-hmm. Share, which we mentioned as well on the, on the show. Uh, yep. There's the, the YouTube channel, which is also very active and has the live streams that you mentioned. Is there, yep. is there anything else that I'm missing? Uh, Instagram. Instagram is becoming like a, a big one for us right now. Like a lot of, uh, we try to push as much uh, images as possible so that to inspire, just to inspire and like to, to pay tribute to our community because like what, what they're producing is so awesome. We love to yeah. love to brag about it and see how they're cool. To, to, due to a tiny bit of our, our impact with, with our tools, right? But yeah, Instagram is becoming the, the a big one. Twitter accounts, like the official Twitter account, obviously the Twitter accounts of all of our guys. Like they, they're they're like some of our some of our people in my team are, are very active. Um, the regular press, I would say, also is a, is a, is a, is a way to, uh, or regular or not regular, like uh, all people like you, obviously, uh, our session is a big one, actually. You, you can see if you, if you look at every day, the new stuff, like every day we have, we have our Slack. Oh, yeah, we, we have a um, Discord, um, Discord uh, community, which is very, very active and yeah. awesome. Yeah, I was mentioning our Slack, on internal Slack, we have a made with substance and made with medium and made with uh, dimension. Uh, or we have also misc substance awkward like yeah, the the thing that we, <laughs> that's interesting but that's a bit awkward but yeah it's uh, most of the time it's it's coming from uh, a lot of that is coming from um, places like uh, Behance uh, Art Station obviously um, and 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 sometimes other uh, Sketch Fam and, and uh, nice places like this so it's it's really like we try to be everywhere but yeah I mean like the the hub is really I would say uh, substance 3D.com and um, yeah, Twitter mostly for my part, but like, yeah, depending on where you want to enter the world of substance, there is an entry door. <laughs> and trying out the tools is really easy to do too. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can download it. It's uh, the free uh, version for I think it's uh, thirty days. Uh, you can you can try it out. Um, you can find the tools on on Steam as well if you don't uh, want to go for um, full subscription. Which, uh, by the way, was something we 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 were going to do anyway with Algorithmic because that's we've seen what people wanted really. <laughs> And but we wanted to keep both, and this is what we're doing. We we have the we still have the option, but for various technical reasons, it was complicated to to do like completely on our website. So it's a uh, part on our website and, and Steam as a as a receptacle for 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 the other type of licenses. Um, yeah, we like we like that. We, we're always investigating like ways to to reach creators. Like uh, these days, we're looking at uh, how can we empower gamers uh, more and and creative gamers. Great. So thank you so much, Sebastian. It's been uh, really nice talking to you and, and going back through history and then uh, all the way to today in the future. And it's always nice talking to you. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you very much. Very much appreciate it. And keep the good work, guys. Uh, we are, we're fans, you know. We, 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 looked at the, we look at the, the website every day, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. See you on ArtStation.com, the global hub for creative professionals. You've been listening to the Art Station Podcast. Hit subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. And please leave a rating and review for the podcast. We promise we'll read them all. See you next time.